Okay, David, I will invite you to be a presenter. Very good. You should see something. Okay, I hope people can see a radiograph. So this yes. uh, fairly young person has a few ill-defined blobs and some extra lines in the lungs, just looking generally junky. Heart size okay, and uh, CT is uh, revealing that there are indeed lots of nodules, extra lines, sort of basal predominant crud, bigger lesion back here, another one back here. So very cruddy looking lungs, lots of septal lines, worse in the bases. And if we switch windows, you can see there's also a considerable amount of mediastinal lymphadenopathy and hyalur lymphadenopathy on both sides. So sort of a starcoid look to the lymphadenopathy. And then with the history of uh, common variable immune deficiency, this lung disease, I think, comes into focus. And there was biopsy confirmation of GLILD. So it's granulomous lymphocytic interstitial lung disease here. It tends to be basal predominant nodules, septal lines, and things like that. And <clears throat> combined with sarcoid-like lymphadenopathy in the um, mediastinum and hyla. So another case of GLILD. And then um, this person has very fine stippling throughout the lungs, so very small nodules, uh, fairly uniform throughout both lungs. A few scars down here, some spine uh, apparatus in place. And on CT, we have nodules and they're very nicely central ovular with sparing of that peripheral edge of the lung so the nodules don't go out to the periphery. They're not clustering along fissures here so they seem to be central ovular. And then if we go to a mediastinal window you'll see that um, the pulmonary artery is large, larger than the aorta so there's pulmonary hypertension and um, Maybe there's a little flattening of the septum here in right ventricular enlargement. So if I give you uh, a nice MIPS here, you will see these central lobular nodules even better. So fairly discrete nodules, uh, fairly sharp nodules. And that goes with their being associated with vessels rather than airways. The airway nodules are often smudgier. So the crisp nodules is good for this condition, which is excipient lung and the kind of vasculitis with the uh, granulomas in the walls of the small vessels from shooting up tablets. I think this was oxycodone, but I'll, I'll check before I post the case. So excipient lung disease here from grinding up tablets and chewing them in. There's this granulomatous vasculitis that results from that with pulmonary hypertension and um, this condition can be lethal. All right, so excipient lung. And um, this person um, was also involved in illicit drugs and was cooking uh, methamphetamine. I have a feeling I've shown this case back in 2019, but I can't find a concrete record of showing it. So uh, perhaps this is a familiar case from before got a really good memory. But this person was uh, cooking um, a methamphetamine and was exposed to uh, ammonia fumes and had came in, I think this was an acute admission at this point with like, this upper lung consolidation or probably some damage, particularly that right upper lobe, which is where inhaled things tend to go, right upper lobe more than left upper lobe. And there's some uh, airway wall thickening and so forth. And then some Patchy uh, mosaic, some mosaic attenuation. This is a low quality CT from the outside, and there were there was a lot of arm uh, overlap artifact above, and generally not a very great quality of CT. So if we go to one month later, the person came back, the same institution outside, 
And now we've resolved a lot of the upper long ground glass. We have a more uniform, um, lower grade ground glass stuff in the upper lungs. We've got a lot of airways disease here. And again, a lot of mosaic attenuation. Now, um, I think this is, I'm not sure whether this is INSP or X. There wasn't a whole lot of difference between INSP and X. So that's supposedly INSP. And X, you see there's not that much airway collapse. So there's not as much air trapping as I thought from the degree of mosaic attenuation, but it may just be that it was not a very effective exhalation. So lots of residual airways disease will definitely larger than so whoever's preparing lunch, please mute. Um, but not um, not as much air trapping as I thought. But airways disease here from inhalation of um, anhydrous uh, ammonia used in methamphetamine production. So people should just say no. <laughs> then I'd like to show you this. Um, older woman here who has a few ill-defined nodules in her lung bases, um, has a very tortuous aorta, and has um, on cross-sectional imaging um, a few nondescript upper lung findings. And then in the lung bases, she has this nodule, which has been biopsied a few times over several years, um, and is not, not a malignancy. And then uh, we have a small cystic abnormality that I'm going to show you. Maybe we have a small one here. We've got a small one um, here along the airways. And then in the left base, we have uh, a very nice cyst down here. So a few cysts, not a, not a ton of them. And then if we um, go to a... Um, soft tissue window, there is a lone calcification down here in the right lung base. So it might not surprise, surprise you to find that this woman has a kappa uh, light chain excess in her blood. It's thought to be, it's not thought to be malignant. So she doesn't have a frank diagnosis of malignancy. So she was hematologically evaluated. She does have kappa light chain uh, deposition disease. And I think we're these are Howard kinds of findings here with cystic lung abnormalities, some lung calcifications, which goes with, um, it's probably ossification in the setting of some amyloid, some protein deposition in the lung, triggering some bone formation, and a few cysts down here. So basal predominant lung disease. This nodule is, uh, showed a lymphocyte, um, <coughs> abnormal lymphocytes. They didn't uh, identify a malignant clone um, there were probably some plasma cells in there too. So light chain deposition disease with mild lung findings and not much change over a few years. Hmm. Okay. Um, Great. And <clears throat> um, this person had a, uh, this is a lymphoma patient who was treated with chemotherapy and achieved a complete response short of going to transplant, but was neutropenic and febrile had this radiograph, really minor symptoms, uh, just you know some, some fevers at home. He wasn't feeling that sick, but his chest radiograph on that clinic visit showed this new nodule in his left apex. The previous radiograph showed clear lungs. And um, this was CT'd, and we have a very nice uh, dense central thing with a halo around it, lots of septal edema nearby small a couple of smaller lesions maybe on the other side also looking fungal and uh you know our first consideration in these situations is that this is going to be um aspergillus i i will check the record to see whether this person was on some suppressive therapy to fight the uh aspergillus so uh, they're often on prophylaxis um and so if you see if you see um a fungal looking nodule that breaks through, it's either an aggressive kind of aspergillus because the suppression is not as strong as the, as the uh, treatment that they use for cure. Um, but another consideration is this could be mucor, this could be a zygomycete. Notice that there's some deformity of the pulmonary artery here. Something is leaning on it and eroding its edge. So 
this was established to be mucor. Um, they were they went in surgically to do an upper lobectomy, which is one of the treatments if you have localized disease. I think they must have discounted the the nodule on the right to do that. But when they found the pulmonary artery invasion at the time of surgery, they abandoned the uh, the operation and backed out. So he still has his left upper lobe in. He now has pneumothorax over that on, on current radiographs. But this was mucor with um, pulmonary artery involvement. So we talk about this being angioinvasive. Uh, this is a big artery that it has chosen to invade. So very, very bad prognostic. Uh, finding. Okay, so mucor with invasion of um, central left pulmonary artery. Let's see if we can see that on the coronal view. I think we see some some effacement of the edge of the pulmonary artery here. It's probably best seen in the cross sections. Okay, so invasive mucor, very invasive mucor. Mm. Okay, yeah, those are my bolus. Thank you. Thanks, David. Who would like to go next? I have this if you want. Seth, is that you? Okay. Yep, that's me. I'll make you presenter, and if it doesn't work, let me know. Uh, okay, we see your. Uh, yeah, so this was a uh, 19, 20 year old kid who came into the ER with um, chest pain, shortness of breath, constitutional symptoms, diarrhea, and uh, fever. And the resident very astutely overnight recognized that there are a lot of nodules throughout the lung, uh, very subtle nodules, but the more you, whoops, the more you blow it up, you can realize that there's a lot of nodules in the parenchyma. And um, you can see them all here. Uh, and she was concerned for tuberculosis, and uh, they got a CT. And I'll just open this up. And we can see, so they read the CT overnight, and they thought it was going to be, um, we're still concerned about tuberculosis. And they kept the person, but you know, I came in in the morning, and um, I think we can realize that these are not random nor uh, perilymphatic nodules. These are all central lobular, um, and they're pretty diffuse throughout the lung. Uh, very fuzzy central lobular nodules uh, would be really kind of atypical for TB uh, to do this. And you can see, uh, in addition to the central lobular nodules, if we get to some areas, uh, you can see that there's some associated septal thickening here. So, uh, you know, when you see diffuse central lobular nodules, and I know uh, Dave showed uh, a couple of his cases, and, you know, whenever you see diffuse central lobular nodules, you know, the, the two things that come up in my mind are, is this some form of um, injection uh, from drugs, i.e. IV, IV talcosis or excipient lung disease? And because I know they don't use talc anymore, but uh, here on the MIPS, you can very nicely see. And and I 100% agree that, uh, and the other thing is some sort of inhalational thing. And I, I've seen, and I've argued about this with a couple of people, senior people, um, you know, Pugach and Galvin, I was arguing with them because I, I, I mean, they've seen a lot more cases of HP than I have, but I, I've still yet to see a case of HP that has central lobular nodules this diffuse. They said they see it. I again, they've seen a lot more than me, so I have to buy it begrudgingly. But you know, when I first saw this, um, my my first thought, and you can see some of the septal thickening in a young kid in California, was that this is going to be uh, IV talcosis, uh, not IV talcosis, sorry, um, EVA. Um, so we know that from our paper that about 10% of people come in with uh, diffuse central lobular nodules. Uh, there's a little bit of basal or sparing here. And another clue that this isn't uh, inhalational, I'm sorry, isn't injection, is the fact that the right heart is normal and there's no findings of pulmonary hypertension. 
So I called the ED. They went in and talked to him, and he smokes marijuana. He vapes marijuana every single day. And about three or four days before coming in, um, he sw- He still bought his stuff from a smoke shop, but switched up his uh, his usual type of vape with something else. Uh, and soon afterwards, developed the symptoms that continue to progress and kind of uh, stay on. This is a a nice case of Ivali, and they treated him with steroids. He was in the hospital for a couple of days. He declined bronchoscopy, but soon after initiation of steroids, he got uh, remarkably better and went home within two days. Um, and on the other side, let's so see. So, Seth? Yeah. Before you leave that case, I, I would argue that those nodules look, look look more like airways nodules than the vasculitis nodules from... Yeah, well, I... Yes, absolutely. Sorry. So they're because, I, they're because they're smudgy. So I yeah. think smudgy versus crisp is helpful in that distinction. I, and and I, I did I not say I, I thought maybe I mentioned that, but yeah, no, I hundred percent agree with you on that. Um, smudgy is very, very, very suggestive of airway. I've not seen an IV talcosis slash these where the nodules are that fuzzy. So definitely um, airway. And uh, so I think that, in addition with the right heart, really helps you distinguish. And has anyone else seen a, has anyone seen a case of um, kind of inflammatory HP uh, have that diffuse central ovular nodules? Because again, a lot of people senior to me said they have. I just haven't seen it. Uh, I don't want to say it has doesn't happen, but I yeah, just haven't. Seen I've it. seen it. Me, you know, not oh. often, but not not rarely either. So. I'm okay with HP looking like that, even though it's pretty extensive. Yeah, because there wasn't much ground glass and there was no mosaicism, but uh, nonetheless, I guess yeah. that's, that should also be in the differential. I kind of came down hard on Ivali, and that's fortunately what the person had. So here's an, an interesting case to kind of go along the uh, central ovular nodular thing. But the interesting thing, so this patient has relatively diffuse central ovular nodules. And you can see that the entire lung is involved, except for the lingula and the left lower lobe. And um, the reason why there's no involvement of the lingula and the left lower lobe is because, sorry, I'm doing this from home, so it doesn't window very well. Uh, You can see that there is no blood flow to that because those vessels are completely occluded. The left upper lobe is patent. Uh, the lower lobes are occluded. So the reason why, you know, you can understand that what the pathology is probably going to be. So they, this came in as CTEF uh, to one of our, you know, we have a weekly conference where we review all our CTEF cases. I said, uh, I don't think so. Well, there definitely is some thromboembolic disease. Uh, you can see how big her right heart is. Her PA was uh, quite big. She had very severe pulmonary hypertension. And the reason her pulmonary hypertension was so severe wasn't just the uh, lingular and left lower lobe being completely occluded, which was presumably from endocarditis um, or at least some form of uh, infected clot, uh, was also because all these other central ovular nodules are secondary to her injecting uh, stuff through her pick. Uh, This patient highly you know, so I saw this case, I said, this is IV talcosis, um, or sorry, excipient lung disease. And the reason we're not getting anything in the left lower lobe is because there's no blood flow there. So the, the talc can't get there. Or, sorry, the, the methyl cellulose is what it was here, uh, can't get there. So you're not getting any uh, central ovular nodules there. And again, as Dave very nicely uh, said, is that these nodules are very, very well defined. So they did an endar direct to me. I was like, well, it's, it's I don't know. I mean, most disease is not here, but they said, well, it may help her out. And it's funny, she kept denying it. This is a kind of a funny story, but um, during the height of COVID, she was in the hospital and um, she was denying repeatedly that she was using um, IV drugs or her pick for IV drugs. uh, And despite having positive tests for uh, opiates, and as they were talking to her, one of my pulmonary colleagues Um, she kind of pulled up her mask just to make it more comfortable and like a sack of like 10 oxy pills fell out of her mask. She was hiding them in her mask. So (laughs) they're like, okay, Um, you know, anyways. So 
when they did the endarterectomy, they also did a biopsy. And we can very nicely see all this beautiful crystalloid structure within the pulmonary arteries. This is all within the artery here uh, under polarized light. And this was all cellulose. Um, and then they were debating, some of the pulmonologists were wondering if this was cellulose from her because she's on TPN because of a whole bunch of other issues. And I was like, I wouldn't even go there. I mean, this is, come on, this is talcosis. Don't, don't try to make it more complicated than it is. Uh, you can very nicely see this material. But I thought it was really cool that it wasn't involving the left lower lobe because of the, uh, the chronic bone polyp disease that was there. So, so I so thought that well, was the, uh, that's, another, that's another argument against it's being something acquired from, say, aspirating those, uh, those tube feedings and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no. They were saying, so she wasn't saying it was not He was saying, yeah. They're, she, they were saying like the guys found a case report or two case reports that were saying that patients with TPN can develop these things and they can have, and I'm like, dude, I guarantee those case reports are people who are IV drug yeah. users. Yeah. And yeah. they had another case report where they were like, oh, look, it shows it. And the case report actually said that um, upon further review with doing some spectroscopy and, the, and stuff that actually the, the cellulose material was clearly from pills and not oh, from God. TPN. Um, so there are a few case reports out there saying that IV TPN can lead to this pattern, um, but I am because it precipitates, and I I don't buy it. Um, but maybe potentially. Anyways, well, this is David. I think you'll probably agree. I, we've had what at least thirty cases of excipient lung shown over the years, and this is far and away the best. Yeah, I this think. Is, I, with yeah, this is amazing with the yeah. the occluded. PA in the left lower lobe and the path yeah. you have. Congrats. You know, yeah, it's yeah. gorgeous. It, it was so funny because they showed this and I'm like, dude, this is IV talcosis. And they're like, oh, okay, well, yeah. he comes back and denies it. I'm like, I, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> it's IV well, that, talcosis. That, that, frankly, that's almost diagnostic. They always deny. So yeah, of course. They don't course deny. They it, maybe it's something else. And, and that's even, the even lesson. Even yeah. After the pills pulling out of her mask, like literally the guy's like was, the pulmonologist was just aghast. He was like, what? And then she was still denied. Yeah. That's why we have to be the ones to suggest this. Because I, if you don't remember, I, the, one of the cases I saw at Emory was a similar thing where the woman kept denying and denying. And she was like, had her service dog sleeping with her in her hospital bed. And she was smuggling the syringes and drugs in in the service dog's vest. You know, <laughs> they finally found it. You know, it's like, but it was one of those things. It's like, I don't care what you say. This is what it is. Yeah, yeah. So, Seth, are you potentially attributing the occlusive left lower lobe pulmonary artery disease from complications of infectious endocarditis and vegetations embolized and yeah. so on? Yeah, I am. They they don't know why she had it. It, it, okay. it she had it um, around the time she started her TPN. They were wondering if it was some you know conglomerate of TPN junk. They say that, or just the fact that she had a pick because yeah. People with picks can get clots and they can throw off. But when the surgeon went in, I said, I guarantee it's going to be infected junk. And when the surgeon went in there to clean it out, he said that it's, it wasn't typical C. Def. Like the, the artery was yeah. ratty, really hard to open up. He said it looked like old, infect, you know, old infected clot. Um, and I said, yeah, that's because we can't tell unless we have the old one showing the patient clearly at endocarditis. Um, and she, she denied any history of that. But when he went in there, he said, this was not, this didn't pop open. This was really looked like old infected clot. Yeah. So said, uh, did he restore any circulation down there or, or was it, did it still yeah. clean? Oh, absolutely. Um, I didn't download it, but yeah, the post-op um, uh, nuke med study showed uh, return of flow. Not, not perfect, but pretty darn good. Oh, huh. amazing. That's and awesome. the other amazing thing huh. here, let me show this. So here's the other amazing thing. So here's her, here's, here's her angiogram. And I was hoping that, you know, we would be able to see some evidence of disease here. And I would have to go through, I was trying to argue that, um, you know, normally in patients when we, cause we get pulmonary angiograms in everybody, it, you get more, and this is the most filled and get that we usually see more blushing of the very, very distal branches. Like these branches will connect because they eventually they'll blush out and they'll kind of fill in. 
And here they never really do that. They you, they stay separate. You see some mild blushes around here, maybe even some of these little nodules on the end, but it never happened. They're like, no, no, that's just, you know, that's not that atypical. So here's her, but I'm still a little maybe convinced um, that the fact that there's a lot of lucency between these distal areas in, in the subpleural portion here, you can see the lingual left lower lobe gone, um, is due to the fact she has all those microvascular obstructions. Yeah, I agree, particularly in the upper lungs. So the, the left upper here has this big gap sort of yeah. in the center there about 12 o'clock. And the right yeah. one also has upper lung gaps between the uh, the vessels. So you're right, the small vessels are not there. Yeah, no, because I, I wish I had another one to show it. So normally when these blush out, they literally, this all turns kind of fuzzy gray like this stuff because the That's blood's cool. forming in. Yeah. And you're not seeing that here. So I'm like, dude, I think this is all due to the microvascular. And like, oh, she had a high heart rate. Um, they said it was possible. But I, I really think that this may be a sign of those small, tiny yeah. arterial or occlusions. I think there's perfect uh, correspondence with that observation and the pathology that you showed. Yeah, absolutely. No, the path was, the path was gorgeous. Um, no, I told right when they, because I asked the surgeon, he keep told me he took her to surgery i'm like dude you biopsy the lung because the whole time i'm like you got to biopsy the lung you got to biopsy the lung and he's like i biopsy the lung and i first thing i did is wrote the pathologist and i said this is going to be IV talcosis stain it like crazy and really do a you know good job and she did some amazing uh path on it i have like 20 slides that are all each one is as pretty as the other one um this is a cool case this case sent in outside as a cardiac mass i think and it was all non-con studies and it had a big just a big ball down here and um we looked at it and we said okay this is going to be some sort of uh some sort of fistula or some sort of coronary sinus issue um so this patient is kind of interesting the patient had um occlusion of the coronary sinus so the coronary sinus never drained into the thebesian valve so there was a tresia of the coronary sinus dra drainage into the thebesian valve and developed this huge aneurysm. Additionally, there was a fistula between the left circumflex in this. But the cool thing was how this all drained. The body is pretty amazing at um, figuring out drainage pathways. So because the normally we know that the coronary sinus, and if there was a fistula to the coronary sinus, it would all drain into the right atrium. But because of that, and this is a delayed image, because that root was uh, obstructed, this huge aneurysm, which I have some movies and you can see flow in. Um, here you can see it's clearly filling. If you follow it up, again, I'm sorry, this thing is runs real slow on my home computer. You'll see that this drains up and then through a very strange little collateral vein goes up here and drains into, uh, sorry, it's jumping around, into this left-sided SVC and up the left-sided SVC and into the, as we know, the brachiocephalic main. So it was basically a, the left-sided SVC drain, you know, having drainage into the brachiocephalic main, uh, allowing for drainage of this left circumflex to coronary sinus fistula with an atretic, um, the BCN valve. So, and we have an MRI on it, so if I can go through this very slowly, you can see this little nugget kind of coming here. And if you follow this thing very slowly, it will actually drain uh, and connect with, here we go, here's that connection into that fistula circuit. And I think the reason it was so dilated in fistulas is that this kind of connection is quite small. Um, so I just thought that was a really, a really pretty case. Was all of the cardiac circulation going into this tiny little vessel? All I mean, of the venous circulation. So well, the doesn't seem adequate. Doesn't seem adequate to uh, to provide very good coronary blood flow. Then I mean, it must be must be backed up. But well, the coronary yes, there's coronary venous drainage was through here. Um, the patient actually had normal function, and I'm sorry, this is going really slow. You can see this kind of shooting. If you had a full speed, it would be shooting into here, and you would see the blood flowing around here. Um, the LV function was actually, believe it or not, normal. 
Um, there was some strange, I, I don't know what to do with it. There was some strange thickening of the inferior lateral wall in the circumflex territory that maybe had some very mild delayed enhancement. It was some min-myocardial delayed enhancement on the MRI. I didn't show it because I don't know what to do with it. You can see the segments a little thickened. But the coronary, you know, there's not a ton of coronary venous. I mean, there's coronary veins. I, I, I agree it's probably not as good as having a normal coronary sinus, but um, but yeah, and I, I think maybe that's why the aneurysm formed and then it just developed some sort of pop-off valve and drained into that left SVC. Clearly a congenital issue. Um, but I don't know how much blood actually goes to the coronary veins. Um, I, I would need. And then one last case that's, I've again, another CTEP thing, which I've never seen. Um, I apologize because I really should be doing this from another station that isn't so darn slow. So this guy is a young kid, clear occlusion of this left PA or left lower low PA. And if you follow these out, there's no contrast at all in there, the posterior segment remains um, a pacified is not occluded. But what you'll see is as you go out more distally, uh, all of a sudden you will see that some of these uh, segmental and subsegmental vessels in the left lower lobe begin to slowly and surely, if I get out there, begin to, yeah. All right, it's not showing very well. Anyways, this guy, I won't waste everyone's time because it's going very slow. This person developed PA to PA collaterals. So there are a bunch of collateral vessels that actually connect the posterior segmental branch, the other occluded branches, and allow for distal flow. And I'll, it's better seen on the angiogram because it's not showing very well here. I don't want to waste any more time, but let's see here. Is this it? Let's see. Oops. Yeah, this is so you will see that as they inject, let me start hmm. at the beginning. They inject, and there's no blood flow to any of these vessels out here. This huge vessel fills in, and then through all these collaterals you can see running through here, actually start to fill all the distal vessels in the uh, lateral and anterior segment of the left lower lobe. So there were, and again, uh, if my thing was running smooth, you, you would see it very clearly, but they were very nice. Um, I, and, you know, we were speculating, you know, they had never seen this either, uh, these PA to PA collaterals. So they, and this kid was maybe, um, 18 or 19, so they speculated that this must have happened very, very, very early in life and that he was able to, you know, during development, uh, develop these arterial to arterial pathways that allowed for flow into the uh, distal segmental branches that were, that were occluded. I don't know. I, the CT actually is pretty good if it, if it was, wasn't so slow, but uh, I'm kind of waiting. Yeah, that's pretty strange. And yeah. have you speculated about the etiology of the vascular occlusive process more proximally? Oh, he has CTEF. He had, um, oh, really? like, when he, was young, when he was younger, he had uh, DVT and, and PEs. And so he had, um, and he had CTEF. And he has disease elsewhere. He's got disease on the right, too. Um, so it, it looked more like classic CTEF. We just had never seen these um, these collateral vessels like this. Hmm. Yeah, we thought it was really weird too. Um, but if if you were able to follow these out, you, here we go. You can kind of see where this vessel is occluded here, and then it distally gets really big, and that's because collaterals from here. You could follow it around, we'll touch into there and actually feed that vessel. And that was happening at multiple levels. Anyways, like here, the vessels occluded and then all of a sudden it pacifies and that's from collateral vessels uh, from this very tortuous, weird. Uh, yeah, here, here's the actual connection. You can actually see the connection there. 
I've never seen that pulmonary artery, no. pulmonary artery either. Yeah, they've done, uh, you know, lots of uh, CTEF getting there. Like, we've never seen that. That's pretty fascinating. So but, this uh, is the world's best corkscrew, too. That's a very nice corkscrew vessel. Yeah. yeah. But it's probably more corkscrew because it's getting, all, basically, all the blood is going through there and connecting through these. There's no real other corkscrews elsewhere. But you can see there's other signs of CTEF. There's other areas that are narrowed. And this wasn't a vasculitis. They actually went in and, and treated it, and it came out like CTEF. And they they know right away when it's vasculitis. They say it, it it's they get pissed when I don't call it prospectively because it really um, is a different. You don't want to take those guys to surgery. Anyways, I, I I had not. We we really thought that was neat. All right. Great. Good stuff. Sorry. Okay, Travis. I'll make you a presenter. Okay. This is a quick incidental one. This was a, on a trauma CT. This guy is actually from from the jail. I'm not exactly sure what the trauma was, but uh, but you'll see, and this is along Seth's discussion of coronary sinus and such. He has some edema at this point in time. I'm not gonna show the lungs, but you'll see in his left atrium, you can notice that he has a little extra amount of soft tissue in, in vaginating here posteriorly. and so. This is an example of a core triatriatum sinister. And of course, when I was showing this to the residents, one of the residents was left-handed and took offense at the, the whole concept of, of sinister and left, but uh, we won't get into the etymology of that today. Uh, I don't think that this is actually restrictive or causing his edema. I think he, because he didn't come in in pulmonary edema, but I think he's just getting overloaded with fluids on the ortho service as, um, I think he had had some lower extremity fractures, but but, it, the, but it's interesting, right? Sorry to interrupt you, but the left-sided yeah. vein is going to drain into the anterior chamber, correct? Oh no, they don't. Uh, no. no, everything yeah. drains into the one chamber. Yeah. Never mind. And I thought he that, also has, yeah, so. he does have some of the little septal pearls or or venous lakes that that Howard first showed us uh, with the edema. But Seth, what's Interesting about this one is check out the coronary sinus because I, I saw this afterwards that you know one of my colleagues read this and I, I feel like there's osteoletresia of this coronary sinus because it definitely drains into the this portion of the left atrium. And I don't know if it also drains into the right atrium or not, but I was trying to figure out where the contrast, you know, maybe there's a small connection and this is a form of an unroofed coronary sinus. Okay, so but, uh, I have a couple of cases of unroofed with a um, coronary sinus atresia. Um, and I actually have, yeah, I actually had another one I was going to show, but I just didn't want to waste time. But yeah, that's, do you see the unroofed, is, do you see the drainage into the left atrium? We definitely see the drainage into the left atrium right here. But so I guess to be unroofed coronary sinus, I always thought that it was a shunt because you had connection to both the right and the left. And I, I definitely think there's a communication here just based on the way the contrast is flowing. And I can't make out one with the the right atrium at all. Yeah, but it's good, right. So this is the sense that the only thing that's being shunted here, if at all, would be the coronary sinus blood flow going to the wrong right. side. Um, right, so it's of, of little significance. Exactly. But, but you're right, because I actually thought about this whole asymmetric edema thing and was looking to see if the pulmonary veins on the left side drained you know, into this portion of the chamber, but they don't. Yeah, that's exactly so I, what I Yeah. But, and he had had a CT when he came in a couple of days before, there was more motion and there was no edema there. So anyway, he's, uh, he's back, in, back in jail now. So we didn't get an echo to further evaluate this, but it's an incidental core triatriatum. And then, the unroofed coronary sinus. Uh, this one, nice radiograph. I'll just I'll uh, throw the PA and the lateral up side by side and give you a, a moment to uh, inspect and yep. comment. Yep, um, there is opacity as well as air, and I can't tell about a fluid level in the superior portion of the azigoesophageal recess, both white stuff and black stuff, and yeah. air. Almost like a diverticulum, maybe. 
yeah, and I think it's it's you can see it on the on the PA view. It's kind of like azagosophageal recess, like you said, also a little subcarinal here. Um, but yeah, so that that was the finding, and good pickup on the radiograph. And you'll see there was some debate as to what the the origin of this is, but you see it's this this air and fluid filled structure in the sub predominantly in the subcarinal space, but as you said, occupying the azagosophageal recess as well. And so, you know, I would have just said that this is probably a bronchogenic cyst, you know, or foregut duplication cyst, whether it's bronchogenic or, or esophageal, I'm not actually sure. I would, I guess, I was thinking it's more likely to be bronchogenic. I guess the pulmonologist actually bronched him looking for a connection. They didn't see anything. So they were presuming then that it was from esophageal origin, but, but we've seen, people have shown cases before of, of air filled foregut duplication cysts, and you don't have to have a communication. I don't think this guy was asymptomatic. This was a lung cancer screening follow-up. So, you know, mm. curious on your thoughts. Well, I, it's, I think it's a bronchogenic cyst. It's a classic location. Yeah. And, um, and they, you know, they can get infected. So he needs to have this removed because he's a real setup. Uh, obviously there is a communication because there's air in it. And so that all that um, mucus in there is going to get infected. So, yeah, you know, this yeah. needs to come out. Did, did yeah, I, was I, on this first study, did he have it, but it was just smaller and not air filled? Uh, let's, I don't remember how far, no, there, there, it was air filled on both of them. And these are four months apart. You can yeah. see, you know, the bubbles are, are moving around some, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I agree, David. I didn't, you know. Yeah, this I, I agree. Fact, yeah. yeah, I think the fact that they didn't see a communication doesn't mean this isn't a, uh, a uh, oops, that this, you know, this is still probably bronchogenic. Hmm. And I'll show one more just because I have only seen one of these and it was years ago. I was actually looking for a good example in a textbook chapter we were putting together, but as you can see, trauma and certainly an abnormal radiograph. This uh, motor vehicle crash, you know, maybe a little bit of rotation, maybe, uh, but regardless, the the amount of tracheal displacement way out of proportion to that. So you imagine that there's a large hematoma here, or at least a hematoma that's displacing the trachea. Notice the AP window is kind of effaced here. There's some widening of the right paratracheal region as well. Looks like you've got some extension superiorly, so blood probably along the left subclavian artery is as a, uh, a, a the left apical cap. Maybe you could argue the older signs like the displacement of the uh, left main stem bronchus, but this was all done outside. He actually underwent a C-spine and head CT first. And you'll see that there, he has a fracture of his clavicle. I suspect it was probably dislocated as well, but you can see all the mediastinal blood surrounding the aorta. So they did go on to a trauma chest, abdomen, pelvis CT. And there's mediastinal blood and you don't see an aortic injury in the expected location, but I think this is why it's always important. I think. The one case that I saw before was initially had been overlooked too. And right here, you know, we think about the, the isthmus is the most common place we see an injury than the root and the diaphragmatic hiatus occasionally, but this was actually at the origin of his brachiocephalic artery that he had a traumatic aortic injury. And so I don't know how, you know, mechanistically, whether this is a, this is a pinch from the fractures, whether it was a combination of that plus deceleration. He has other rib fractures here too, but they actually did not intervene on this guy You know, for that. He had other distracting injuries. This was the follow-up a few days later, still mediastinal hematoma. And you can more clearly see when he got here, they did this study, more clearly see the pseudoaneurysm. And then I just saw this because this was actually from a while ago, and this was a follow-up. And so he has a a healed post-traumatic pseudoaneurysm of his brachiocephalic artery. And it's getting a little bit bigger, but they're going to continue to watch it. So. You wonder, yeah. you know, the, there's a lot of blood around it. Um, do you think the blood has just come from those um, injured um, ossify, uh, bone structures, the 
the clavicle, etc. There's a lot of blood. There. I, no, I think the blood is from the aorta because it's I'm really centered right around here, and you have a hematoma mm -hmm. in the aorta. There's certainly some anteriorly from from the sternum and the clavicle, and I, I I'm guessing his he had a transient clavicular dislocation as well. I couldn't find that in the notes, but in addition to the fracture, uh, but this, yeah, I think this, I mean he has pseudoaneurysm. I mean I guess this is a traumatic IMH too, right? I mean not yeah. the pseudoaneurysm, but if you go down. To the rest of the aorta, right here. Like, yeah, 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 like there, and along I mean, the ascending aorta as well. Yeah, I got. I don't know if I've. I, I mean, I'm sure I must have seen that. I just don't. I've I've seen. I had one at Emory. There was a traumatic brachycephalic artery injury at the right in the same location, and I can't remember if it was deceleration or if it was more of this, like if this is more of like an osseous pinch type of phenomenon with all of the uh, the fractures. But yeah, he, he definitely has traumatic intramural hematoma in addition to that injury at the, at the origin. Um, you wonder to what extent the blood could be from the intramural hematoma injury could be oozing through the adventitia and accumulating in the mediastinum. And the reason I say that is because I'm going to show you guys a case after yours. And I'm now I'm wondering whether that could happen because you never showed contrast extravasation out of the lumen of that brachiocephalic as such, right? No, but but we don't, frequently don't see extravasation at the isthmus either. You know, it's like there's there's strands, presumably strands of adventitia holding this together. And yeah, it's it's leaking from, you know, how much of the wall is left intact here. I don't know. I, get, I, I see your point. Yeah. You know, and I think, because, you know, the, yeah, but. Yeah, the usual teaching for acute traumatic um, aortic injury is that if you see a lot of hematoma, then the blood is coming from injured small mediastinal vessels, not from the lumen of the aorta itself. Is kind of one traditional way of teaching. Yeah. Yeah. But this one is. So go ahead, Howard. No, that's really interesting because if I saw correctly, you showed quite a lot of intramural hematoma there, right? Mm hmm. In the aorta. Oh, huh. yeah. Okay. Wow. All right. Um, yeah, let me show you this case. So, do I need to make myself presenter? Yep. Okay, so this is a lady that came to us. And the history that I just had in the beginning was that at the outside hospital, she was diagnosed with a lot of pleural blood. So certainly here we see a lot of left pleural blood. And then in a moment when I show you the CT's pleural, you'll see there's a lot of abnormality in the paraaortic mediastinum here and or the wall of the aorta itself. So let me bring up the first CT. So this was done on the same day, the 12th, 13th, the next day, okay? And I'll go through this to show you how much pleural fluid there is, as well as very hyperattenuating blood in that left hemithorax as well. And then when we go up here, there is clearly blood in the mediastinum, in the paraaortic mediastinum right here. And as I show you the case, if you make any other observations, certainly uh, tell me. So that's what we see so far. So I'm going to leave that one up and then show you some follow-up CTs. So the next one, this one is... 13. This one is going to be, and we did with and without contrast. 13. Eighteen. Sorry, let me go back and do this.
and don't want those to go together so let me just leave this one up here and show you this now we've really nicely opacified the lumen of the aorta there so let me just try to get to the same level before and you'll see that we have they've put in a chest tube so they've drained blood you can still see some but not increasing para aortic mediastinal blood but look at the appearance of the aorta here and i'm going to try get the same level on the previous one so again there are five days between these two and now we have that and to my eye when i look at this portion of the distal aorta right here compared to the previous it seems to be bigger right here as if the wall is now thin and friable and look at the attenuation abnormality here in relation to the lumen right there let's see if i have another one as well so that's 718. So now I'm going to go to, I should to me, the 20th. Bring that in here. And now look at this portion of the aorta here compared to here. What pathology do you think is going on right there? This is like very abnormal, but I was surprised as to how much blood we have in the mediastinum. We have left pleural space blood, but at no time did I actually see contrast medium exiting the lumen of the aorta there. But this portion of the aorta is very abnormal. So is this some form of penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer, intramural hematoma, combination thereof? They actually presented with mediastinal blood and left hemothorax substantial. I'm perplexed about what's going on here. Any thoughts? I agree. I don't know what how to describe this pathology exactly, but. Yeah, it's some combination of an ulcer, that's the penetrating ulcer, and then it, it's bleeding into the wall. So some intramural hematoma. I, I think there's some, yeah. It's just the ulcer is bleeding. And basically, do you think that um, there is disruption of the parietal pleura and, and that amount of blood leaked into the pleural space in the absence of a frank ruptured aneurysm, right? Yeah, I don't. Have you seen IMH? I don't know if I've seen an IMH. I don't know why. Yeah. They I didn't hear that. I said I've seen. You know, we've all dissections that decompress and space, but I don't know why. It would be. Sorry, there was a bunch of noise there. I didn't get that. Do you guys also agree that the wall here seems to be expanding and falling apart, as it were, or potentially falling apart right here? Getting bigger. Yeah, you were going to turn into like, like an ulcer like projection here. At, at some point, that's going to need to be, yeah. Yeah, so you're not surprised they did this, yeah. Yeah, they would definitely need to do that. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know exactly what's going on in that order, in the uh, in the wall of the A order, but I think there's a lot of pathology in there, and there's an association between the pathology here and the rest of it, the mediastinal hematoma and the hemothorax and all the blood. Let me see. All right, kind of a strange case of acute aortic syndrome, I think. This is seven days apart here.
This, these are just delayed images. All right, everyone, thank you. Those are great cases. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Howard. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.